In motoring, Triumph is a name synonymous with sports cars, family saloons and innovative cars that paved the way for modern car making. With the Triumph Herald that became one of the most successful platform shares in British motoring history, underpinning the Triumph Vitesse, Spitfire and GT6. Triumph was also known for making incredible sports cars like the TR series of cars, with the final one being the TR7, a space-aged wedge that brought the 80s to the mid-70s. There are some Triumph cars and conversions that are lost to time, so mysterious that there is little information on them, with forgotten failed luxury dolomites and incredible Tickford stags. This is the story of the lost tuned triumphs and conversions. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. This video has taken a long time to put together because of so many different sources and so many unknowns of these wonderful triumphs. From the stag Tickford, a one-off commission that is still believed to be in existence and the wonderful Panther Rio, a small luxury car that was designed to be a penny-pinching Rolls-Royce. Now, make sure to subscribe to the channel because you get to see more of this and you'll also get to keep up to date with the Project 2600R, which I'll be updating in the next video. Now, I've bought a load of parts for this. This is basically my attempt at making a two, dispelling the 2600 um, PE 166 rumours that it's a terrible engine by reverting all of the neutering that it had when it was made. Um, so subscribe for that and subscribe for more of this stuff. Drop a like on this video and comment your Triumph memories in the description below. My Triumph memory is a TR7 on a driveway when I was a kid. I'm wondering what the heck that was. And then eventually that leading to my Rover obsession at age eight. And then of course, here we are today, still obsessed with old British cars and classic cars. Now, without further delay, further waffling, and some viewing some interesting stuff behind me. Let's get into the video. The Triumph 2500 PI 4x4. The Triumph 2500 PI Mark II was launched in 1969, styled by Michelotti. The straight six engine was carried over from the 1968 model year Triumph 2500 PI with its Lucas mechanical fuel injection system. The estate model of the 2500 was a workhorse of a car, a car that could be used as a utility and for enjoyment. One Swiss customer, though, they thought that the 2500 estate needed a bit more utility. Enter Ferguson Research. Ferguson Formula 4-wheel drive was a division established by the company created by the man who is considered to be the father of the modern tractor, Harry Ferguson. Ferguson Formula's goal was simple, create four-wheel drive versions of road cars for customers. The Triumph 2500 PI estate was sent to Ferguson by a Swiss doctor who wanted a Triumph that could get him anywhere, anytime. And in such a mountainous country with at sometimes unforgiving weather conditions, four-wheel drive seemed to be the only option. Ferguson Formula fitted the car with a bespoke four-wheel drive system with a viscous coupling for its centre differential and is said to be the first road car equipped with this technology. The car was then delivered to the customer in 1972 and featured in Auto Car Magazine of that year because of how unique this 2500 PI was. The Swiss doctor kept the car using it daily until 1983. It was then sold to its second owner who used it as a transport to his luxury Swiss holiday home. In 2000, the car was sold again to its third owner, who had the car fully restored in 2003. After relocating to the Netherlands, the car was then sold again in November of 2022. The car has seen some use with its odometer reading at the time being 60,574 kilometers or 37,638 miles. This unique car is now in a private collection and is considered to be one of the rarest Triumph estates ever made. There is only one in existence. The Stag Tickford. Back in 1982, one of the most legendary names in tuning, coachwork and conversions were given the task by a mysterious customer. Take a 1975 Triumph Stag and make it more luxurious, faster and more aggressive. This was quite a challenge, however, with the Stag subject to these modifications already being seven years old. Despite this fact, Tickford set to work. On the inside, a burr walnut dashboard was chosen, Connolly Hyde for the seats and Wilton carpeting throughout, with an upgraded in-car entertainment system to finish it off. On the outside, the most extensive modifications took place. 
Wheel arches were flared to accommodate the wider wheels and Pirelli tyres. The ride height was lowered around 30mm with uprated suspension to improve handling. The styling was inspired by an Aston Martin Vantage with a bulge in the bonnet and a scoop. Chrome delete, a blacked out grille, electric windows and a black repaint that made it become a stealthy stag. When it came to the drivetrain modifications, this is somewhat of a mystery, with no mention or any information on what modifications took place to the Stags V8 engine. The only information I have is that it is 200 brake horsepower and it has a larger exhaust. All of this resulted in a mean looking Triumph Stag, which was a true one of one car. The car is registered under 1KMA and still survives to this day, but its location is unknown, with its last V5 being issued in August of 2016. The car is currently on Sawn, and if you are the owner of this car and you would like to dispel any mysteries, or if you have any information, please let me know. I've got an email contact and an Instagram contact in my bio on YouTube. This is one of the most mysterious triumphs ever made, and it is truly just a, a real... Um, a real Loch Ness monster of the Triumph Stag's history. The Panther Rio. Panther West Winds was a niche car company that created luxury cars. Panther was founded by Robert Jankel in 1972. Initially, Panther manufactured vintage style cars based upon modern cars at the time. The Panther Lima was their first attempt at this, which used the Vauxhall Viva and Vauxhall Magnum's underpinnings. Following the 1973 energy crisis, Panther turned its attention to the Triumph Dolomite. The Triumph Dolomite was launched in 1972 to complete Triumph's small car range, replacing the Triumph Herald. Panther, however, thought this relatively new sports saloon with its slant 4 engine would be a good basis for a car of their own. A family saloon unlike any other on the market. A true mini Rolls Royce. The Rio was meant to be a statement of taste. Not as vulgar as a Mercedes, not as expensive as a Rolls Royce. A small British car in the middle ground. The Panther Rio was launched in September of 1975 with the original Panther press release stating this. The Rio combines characteristics combined in no other single car. The very highest level of luxury appointments and true smooth quietness with superb handling. A 115 mph max speed and a 0 to 60 time in 8.7 seconds. Inside, the Rio had all of the luxury appointments of the time Connolly leather, deep pile carpeting, and burr walnut for that limousine feel. All of this was hand built with coach built quality. On the outside, new wheels and additional chrome was added, new lights and a grille also with the lights and a grill looking very similar to the Silver Spirit and Silver Spur of the 1980s and 1990s, which of course is an appropriate nod, as this is the pinnacle of luxury. The engine remained the same, with the base model coming with the 1850cc and the Especial, which was based on the Dolomite Sprint, including a 2.0-litre 16-valve engine. Panther then spoke with HR Owen, one of the largest luxury car dealer networks in the country hoping they could add the Rio to their distribution network with an initial order of 100 cars, placing the Rio in dealers alongside Aston Martin, Rolls-Royce and other luxury marks. Sadly, this deal never materialised. The cost of the car was simply too much, with the top-end model costing £9,445 back then, almost £2,000 more than a Jaguar XJ, with the base car costing £3,283, that was the base Triumph Dolomite. It was simply priced to fail. That is more than £5,000 extra. Panther sold 38 Rios, but sadly it's not known how many of these cars survived, with only four being accounted for in private ownership. The TR7 slash TRZ. In 1981, a writing instrument manufacturer known as Schaefer launched a stylish new pen called the TRZ. At the time, another popular thing was on sale with TR in the name, which Schaefer thought would be a good idea to customise to promote their new line of pens. Internally, Schaefer must have thought, what is as exciting as a pen? A two-seater British sports car. But joking aside, it was a very nice pen. Schaefer set to work on acquiring a car, choosing the TR7, which was, of course, the most logical choice. The idea was simple. Create a tribute to this pen with the TR7 as a base and use it as a competition prize. The work was then awarded to Wooden Pickett to turn the TRZ into reality. 
The car was created that year with mainly cosmetic changes. New graphics, one of which was very prominent on the front of the car, the TRZ graphic, two-tone silver and black paintwork, and a set of Wolf Race wheels for the outside. Most of the changes were focused on the interior, however, with most of the interior being clad in Silver Fox Draylon Velvet. The dash was also changed and modified to house a central binnacle to incorporate a Crown 150 onboard computer and a Blaupunkt Berlin stereo. The changes to the interior didn't stop there, however. The car included other refinements, cruise control, digital locking via a fob, and a stock mounted remote control for the radio. When the car was finished and the competition was launched, any UK resident over the age of 18 who bought a TRZ pen was eligible to enter to win the car. The competition involved guessing the precise mileage on the car's trip computer. The mileage was accumulated on the drive taken on the acquisition of the car from Triumph Sully Hull HQ to Schaefer's headquarters in Hemel Hempstead, with the exact route being a mystery. There were some hints to the route, however, in the marketing materials, with the route reportedly incorporating a 117 mile per hour drive around BL's test track at Gaydon. If you weren't lucky enough to win the car, you could win a suitably 80s prize, a Sinclair ZX81. Unfortunately, the last known sighting reported by AR Online was not a good one. The car was last seen in 1986 in the public car park at Brands Hatch, looking worse for wear with the chances of survival looking grim. There was only one Triumph Schaefer TRZ made by Wooden Pickett, the Avon Acclaim and Avon Acclaim Turbo. The last car to wear the Triumph badge, for better or worse, was the 1981 Triumph Acclaim, a rebadged Honda Ballade. Ladbrook Avon, a coach builder established in 1919, were well known to create some interesting cars, including their most popular conversion, the Jaguar Avon Estate, a converted XJ6. Avon's special products, as they were known in the 1980s, turned their attention to Triumph's latest offering. The coach builder wanted to move into a more accessible price range to increase sales volumes, so they created a special version of the newly launched Triumph Acclaim. The car got a real makeover worthy of the Avon name. On the outside, a chrome-plated front grille was installed, a vinyl roof, duotone paint and colour-coded wheels with a unique metallic finish, moving the car firmly upmarket. On the inside, seats, door trims and armrests were retrimmed in Connolly leather with colour-coded piping. The dashboard and door cappings were clad in burr walnut veneer. The modifications didn't stop there. In 1983, another version was launched, the Avon Acclaim Turbo, developed in collaboration with Turbo Technics, a conversion increasing the power from the standard 70 brake horsepower to 105 brake horsepower using a Garrett AI Research Type 3 turbocharger with supporting modifications. On the outside, the turbo included the period correct turbo graphics, a small rear spoiler, a more aggressive front spoiler and a bump on the bonnet and lunar alloys. The turbo also had uprated suspension to enhance the handling, but unfortunately, as reported by Autocar, the handling felt a bit floppy. The price of the standard Acclaim was £4,829, with the conversion to the Avon Acclaim costing £1,365 extra, and the turbo conversion costing £2,990 extra available through the Austin Rover Group dealer network. Unfortunately, no sales numbers exist, but it is believed only a handful of these cars are still in existence, with four being posted on the internet in the last four years. The Crayford Tracer TR7. The TR7 sports car was one of Triumph's most radical designs, the shape of tomorrow, but Crayford Engineering thought it was time to inject a bit of practicality into the mix. Crayford Engineering in the mid to late 70s had established itself as one of Britain's best producers of conversions, mainly estates and convertibles. In 1976, Crayford set to work on developing a sporting estate from the Triumph TR7, and in 1977 unveiled this automotive misfit, the Crayford TR7 Tracer. The car looked endearingly awkward, extending the roofline of the TR7 and incorporating a narrow opening hatchback. Inside, the additional space allowed for a rear folding seat, making this car a 2 plus 2, achieving Crayford's initial aims in both passenger and load capacity improvement. The car, oddly enough, echoed Triumph's own 2 plus 2 version of the TR7, codenamed the Lynx. The car, though, was not to be produced in mass. The awkward-looking TR7 would have not stood 
a chance against the stunning Scimitar GTE of the time, with the project being wound up with only one car completed. The car was then lost to time and put in storage, until it was acquired by Chris Turner, the chairman of the TR Drivers Club. The car had a colour change from its original inky yellow to red in that time and was in a very bad state. The car was then restored in the beginning of 2022 with its show debut at the NEC in March of 2023. There is only one of these cars in existence and Chris put it back to its original inky yellow, making it as correct, as period correct as it should be. The Dolomite Sprint Wooden Picket. In 1976, legendary converters and tuning specialists Wooden Pickett turned their attention to the Dolomite Sprint. There is an, um, unfortunately, there is absolutely no information available on this car. The only information I can find is from Matthewson's and um, their show Bangers and Cash. The Dolly Sprint received the usual signature Wooden Pickett treatment though. Two-tone paintwork, a retrimmed interior with extra lashings of walnut and leather, a Wooden Pickett steering wheel and some extra refinements, an electric sunroof and electric windows, central locking and an electric boot release. There is only two known to exist with one painted in Tahiti blue over gold and another that appeared in Bangers and Cash at Mathewson's in green over white. The locations of these cars are believed to be in private collections and if you have any more information on the Dolomite Wooden Picket put it below or if you perhaps own the car let me know. I'd love to hear some more information about it and potentially come and see it. These conversions took some Triumph cars into territories unknown from complete one-offs like the Stag Tickford, a relatively unknown commission, to the Avon Acclaim based on one of the most controversial cars to wear the Triumph name. Unfortunately, we lost the Triumph name from the British motoring industry in 1984, with its last car being a rebadged Honda, which is a true tragedy. The Triumph Motor Company is really just one of the least covered in new media anyway, quote new media, is one of the least covered um, car manufacturers. And it's, it's a real shame. A 139-year-old brand at the time of filming in 2024, it's just a real, it's a real shame that it's just disappeared from the public consciousness. Um, of course, British classic car enthusiasts and British car enthusiasts know the Triumph name, but myself as sort of someone that's a relatively, well, some would say relatively young, um, British car enthusiast and classic car enthusiast, it really took me a lot of diving deep to find this, and it's truly just a bit sad. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more in this. Now, there are a few videos out there sort of doing the abridged history of like uh, the select models like the the Spitfire and the, the Stag and all that, but it's not. there's not really any in-depth stuff about the actual, um, the actual company. Of course, it, the, the company has passed through several hands, Standard Triumph, um, when it was acquired by um, Standard, I believe, just after the war. And then, of course, British Leyland until its eventual retirement in 1984. The mark, of course, was acquired by BMW, and they, I believe they still own that today. Now, there's been a lot of um, a lot of Triumph cars that just have flown under the radar. Um, for example, the, um, the, the Triumph's Herald sort of received a bit of a, um, a joke, jokey status. From the Top Gear, um, the Top Gear episode where it was used as an amphibious car, uh, it's it's quite sad to be honest with you because the the Herald, um, of course, birthed the the many cars that shared its platform because I think it had a steel tube chassis, um, and it was a very unique way to build a car back then because you could simply just take the you know move new body panels over to it if you you know if you're ever in front of a herald or a gt6 you can literally just lift the, the entire front of the car lifts up and that's what made them so great for diy enthusiasts and classic car enthusiasts because you just lift the whole front of it up and you had perfect access to everything and it's something that's really lost nowadays and i'm sure a lot of you would agree if i want to sit there and i don't know work on a volkswagen golf i've got to take about a thousand plastic panels off and get and you know dig through sound deadening and then then even at that point it's an ECU that controls everything and I'm not obviously um, you know I'm not opposed to technological advancement but I wouldn't mind having more 
you know, hands, the more of the uh, fate of the machine being in the owner's hands rather than an incredibly, um, incredibly vast dealer network that could potentially decide it, decide to disappear and could move everything online. And then where are you then? But Triumph is just one of those names that really is is becoming lost. And I'm I'm hoping that by making as many videos on Triumph as I can. And everybody else, of course, making videos on Triumph. We need to make more Triumph videos because I absolutely love the brand. I love the um, history of the company. I just think it's fantastic. Of course, the Triumph name survives today, still building motorcycles, but no cars, unfortunately, of course, with the last one being in 1984. So it's a bit sad that the last ever Triumph was a Honda, and it's really sad that that is how it ended of course the triumph for claim is a good car i mean of course it is there's nothing that can really go wrong with it and it was the first exercise of a um a foreign car being built in the uk um as part of a partnership with bl obviously um being partnered with honda at the time and then of course that spawned the rover 800 spawned the 200 series and the rest is history so it's really quite sad that all of this has happened the way it has. And I think the British motor industry has a sense of tragedy about it, but and also a sense of inevitable tragedy. tragedy. Um, of course, this is the monologue bit. <laughs> so here we are. Um, and just let me know what you think about all of this because I really enjoy reading the comments. I really enjoy interacting with you guys. And I think it's fantastic what we're doing uh, because it's not just me behind this. All of you guys um, are just, just as much of a part of it as I am. This is just a real good way to document all of these lesser known things. And I'd love to sort of branch out into a, a few more in-depth things, um, as well as exploring, of course, these these real lesser known cars like the one-off Triumph Stag or the, you know, the, the Dolomite Sprint Wooden Picket with literally no information. Um, I couldn't find anything about it, to be honest with you. So I've had to take bits from AR Online, from Matthewson's, from everywhere on the internet, from adverts, you name it, and try to corroborate them and make sure they're correct. And then, of course, produce them into a bit of research for this video. So that's about that, everybody. Um, th that's all from me today. Make sure to subscribe, um, like the video, and drop a comment below. Um, and... I will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Keep watching. Remember to subscribe for more of this. And I'll see you in the next one.